Hello and welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. I'm your host, Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is none other than my friend, Ryan Sipes. Hello. Ryan, how are you doing, man? Pretty good. How are you? It has been quite a while since I got to talk to you last. Um, so how have things been? Pretty good. Uh, I have just been plugging away, working on Thunderbird, and uh, having a good time doing it. So it's been great. Nice. Well, I'm going to, I, I got to read this verbatim because I got to read it. Um, <laughs> your official title is Community and Business Development Manager and Treasurer on Thunderbird Council. Uh, your Steam profile says you're a tech enthusiast, musician, coder, writer, gamer, entrepreneur. And what else do you want to know? And your resume says you're a community builder, organizer, technologist, open source enthusiast, and all around rabble rouser. So we will get into some of that as we go on, but you are the community manager for Thunderbird, but who is Ryan Sipes personally? It's a, it's a uh, interesting question. <laughs> and one that I don't think I've, I've ever gotten, uh, Ryan Sipes is an inquisitive person who uh, uh, I've always been interested in, in tech and figuring things out and, uh, and also in kind of where tech and people meet. You know, I, I really, one thing that I like to do is see people using tech, see how they use it, you know, ask yep. them how they use it. It's very, it's very weird to friends and family because Sometimes I'll go into a coffee shop and I'll see someone using something interesting, some interesting piece of tech. And, and occasionally I've been known to go over and ask them like, <laughs> you know, what are you doing? Why, how do you use this? What do you, what do you use it for? You know, if it's a piece of software or, or you know, if, if it's somebody's using Linux in a coffee shop, they're pretty much going to hear from me yep. and have me ask them questions. <laughs> but, uh, I, I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm just a, a very curious person and with a, an interest in tech. And, you know, I have other interests, which people can see if they follow me on Twitter. But, uh, like, uh, you know, I really, love, I really love learning about governance, governance of projects, gover governance of states, governance of, you know, like just the, the personalities involved and everything in, in, yep. in that world is, is really interesting to me. Some would call it politics, but I think that's, that's a bit, uh, that doesn't really capture what I'm interested in, you know, collective decision-making, which is right. how you become a community manager is kind of an important interest to have. And so, uh, beyond tech, you know, that I'm kind of interested in how people form communities together and make collective decisions. And so that's, that's kind of who I am beyond that. I always have a hobby whatever it is, you know, <laughs> Christmas is coming up. So it's going to be, um, coming up with interesting gifts for people. For instance, I saw the other day, one of my family members is, um, studying computer security. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I saw the, I think it's called the Ponagachi. It's a what Tamagotchi. It's like a Tamagotchi esque, uh, virtual pet, but it's, installed on a raspberry pi with a e ink display and what it does is you collect it you connect it to a, like a battery bank or whatever as you travel around and it um pones wi-fi networks 
Oh, and that's uh, how you feed it. <laughs> and so the it's no good. So <laughs> I think uh, this. Yeah, I th- but I but it is very interesting. And for someone learning about that space, I think it'd be a, a good gift to you know make for them and say like you know this is what this is. This is what it does. This is how it does it. And uh, and let them learn by in a neat through a neat um, project. And right. uh, so anyway, that that is uh, that's me. <laughs> well, you you use uh, Ryan Lee Slipes a lot of places. Yeah. And for the guests of the show, I usually do a little prep work and, you know, I'm not trying to like stalk anybody, but I usually search out uh, people and who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but after searching for Ryan Sipes, you know, every search page comes up with a Ryan Sipes that is a dirt bike racer. So is that the real reason you use Ryan Lee Sipes? Yeah. And I've been a lot more deliberate about it lately. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the worst thing. Yeah. You should, if you name your, when you name your kids, you should give them unique names that people can still spell, (laughs) but uh, it makes uh, SEO, you know, as an individual trying to uh, point people at my work, um, I have to be very deliberate about it. And, you know, lately I've gotten better at saying, you know, these are the ways you find me online. But when people just go to search for me after they meet me at maybe a conference or something, if. They want to know how to get in touch with me. Right. A lot of times they end up falling down a hole. Fortunately, uh, if you type Ryan Sipes into Google, one of the options will be Ryan Sipes Mozilla. <laughs> and, I th- and I think that people <laughs> are using that to find, to find me because I, I, you know, I hadn't typed that in before, but that was one of the recommendations. Right. So, uh, so that's good. But yeah, I wish that. I wish that uh, I didn't share my name with somebody who is very popular. Uh, but yes, that's why I've started using my middle name, Ryan Lee Sipes, in order to try and be able to allow people to find my my work. Well, we will have links in the show notes for all of your stuff. But uh, if anybody's helpful. if everybody's anybody's searching, search Ryan Lee Sipes. <laughs> yeah. So Thunderbird is your full time job, I believe. Yep, that's correct. For a few years now. What is the typical day in the life of Ryan Lee Sipes like? Well, um, I wake up, and something I've begun admitting to that that I didn't used to was um, I am a a putterer. Um, (laughs) I putter around in the morning. Like, I have to have (laughs) this block of time where... I maybe like read the news while I drink a coffee. You know, I have to have my whole day get screwed up if I don't have the like hour or two that I can just kind of make my way through the morning routine. And as a result, uh, you know, I've I've started waking up quite early to do that, five or 5.30 uh, to make sure I have plenty of time so I don't feel rushed. Uh, But I... I I felt really bad about that for a long time. I didn't know what was wrong with me that, you know, if I got up and tried to hop right into work or something, I just would get virtually nothing done <laughs> for the first <laughs> two hours. And then I was reading a um article about uh Jeff Bezos's morning routine and he gave me and he gave me the word putter. You know, he said I putter around in the morning and I have to have that time. And I realized uh, maybe I'm, maybe I'm like that. Maybe I need that maybe time you're in a the putter. morning too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so that's what I've begun explaining to people, you know, especially family members and friends who visit me in the, in the morning. You know, they they see that I I spend a lot of time just sitting around preparing myself, <laughs> and uh, and that that's it. After that, you know, I work remotely, so I work from usually this office or or a coffee shop, depending on if I have any calls that day. And uh, that's like the best thing in life. It was very hard at first to get used to remote work. But once you get used to isolating distractions and keeping them away from you, it's really a great, a great way to work because you get to, you get to kind of select a lot of things about how you work and your space and 
And uh, I just think that if you have an opportunity to try remote work, um, give it give it a shot because I don't miss a commute. I had an hour commute, you know, one way. I, yeah. I was in the city and it was 40 minutes of my last job where I went into an office, 40, 45 minutes to get just into the office and getting that time back to spend with people and doing things that I, you know, want to is really amazing. So, yeah, that's kind of the day. <laughs> it sounds great to work from home. I just don't know if I would be productive at home <laughs> because of that, of the reasons you just said. It is a, it is the number one challenge. It's so easy to get distracted. And, uh, you know, I, I hate, to admit it, it's hard. It's hard to admit it because you know, the, for the first little while of working remotely, I'm sure my productivity was fifty percent, um, and that I think is unavoidable. If you have, haven't had the experience of working from home, you have to change a lot of things um, about your life. You have to change expectations of others in your life. You know, you know if you're at your desk you're working if you're in your office you're working you right. it, if you you can't you tell your family like you can't just interrupt me in the middle of that cuz I'll throw everything off um you got to set boundaries exactly but it's i think it's really healthy in it and it also uh kind of makes you look at all of your habits i i feel like i've looked in looking at how easily i could get distracted while i was working at home i started looking at other ways in my life where I maybe spend too much time doing X, Y, or Z, uh, even when you're not at work, even when you're at home and you're, you are supposed to be spending time with family in a certain way, but you find yourself maybe like browsing Twitter or something and you think, <laughs> okay, well, this is also a distraction. It's a distraction, not from work, but from something else that I value. And so, yeah, uh, it's a big challenge, but but I think uh, I think it's good, and I think it's a future of work too. Uh, so we'll see if that pans out. But it's I think it's our team is really productive. Uh, we communicate asynchronously because everyone's in a different time zone. But I think that is really good because it ensures that we can't just water cooler away a lot of time we have to be really deliberate about communication well i deal with time zones often and i can't say that i've ever put good and time zones in the same <laughs> statement but <laughs> yeah yeah they can it be is tough. hard it is hard to there's a, a co-worker who's um exactly on the opposite uh time zone as, as me so he's 12 hours different right which is is quite hard because Nobody really wants to do a call at, you know, eight in the evening <laughs> and nobody really wants to do a call at like five in the morning. So right. it's, it's just very hard to pick a time if we want to actually get face to face communication done. But, you know, that's one of the challenges, a lot of perks, quite a few challenges, too. Just like everything else, there's good things and there's bad things mm -hmm. to manage it. So from your bio that uh, I listed out, you, know, you have many hobbies. So let's get into some of these hobbies that you have. Do you have ones that are up at the top of the list? Well, you know, I, I feel like I had a lot more back before I worked in open source because a lot a lot of projects were my hobby now because i do it during the day and i usually get to contribute to other projects that aren't thunderbird in order to just help the ecosystem and during during the day too it's it's really cut down on the the hobby of contributing to open source outside of work uh, but uh, you know the the things that have really become hobbies are uh i don't know if this really counts as a hobby but trying to do more physical activity so um what i mean some of that's a hobby hiking i'm in colorado these days so 
uh, my uh, wife has turned me on to hiking, and then uh, and then just in general doing just physical activity, trying to walk or work out every day is, has become a hobby. I decided that I wanted to have a uh, healthier lifestyle uh, and that's work good. on things like my back was, begin was beginning to hurt and that's because I have terrible posture. Um, and so I can kind of correct that if I go and do certain exercises at the gym or at home every evening. So uh, that has become a hobby. And then tinkering. Um, I love tinkering, uh, such as with the Ponagachi and yep. <laughs> and anything with a Raspberry <laughs> Pi would be will be fun for me. Any project I can do with a Raspberry Pi. And then finally, I've uh, just been trying to learn other languages. Uh, it's very something nice. that I think is good for the brain and and uh it also opens you up to understanding people because I work with people from other countries. Um I find that learning their language sometimes uh illuminates maybe how a certain culture looks at the world. And uh, because language is as much as we may not think about it is something that kind of shape shapes how we think. Right. And uh, so that's been something of late that I've that I've been trying and uh Duolingo loves me because I've been really consistent about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have in there a uh, musician. Um uh, tell us about it. So I used to be in a in a touring band and um we we toured the Midwest. Uh I'll let the internet see if they can find music from it i'm not gonna <laughs> give any give anything away um but uh the yeah i i love um playing music i i love writing music i haven't done it so much lately so my bio is kind of out of date in that respect but you can see the guitar behind me sometimes i grab that and play something um i was a vocalist in in a few bands and so uh singing is really where it's at for me but uh but i play i play almost every instrument you would expect in a in a normal rock band oh, nice and so uh i enjoy that but uh, i'm out of practice pretty bad so <laughs> <laughs> I, if i well if i was gonna ever show those skills to the internet i'd have to spend some time getting back into into the swing of things. Well, after doing these Linux spotlights and you meet people and you talk to people uh, on a deeper level, I've been finding more and more people who run Linux are into music, like musicians and, and stuff. So there must be some kind of correlation between music and uh, Linux in general. Yeah, I think that there is. I've seen the same thing. Uh, a lot of open source contributors have um an interest in music maybe it's a human thing but but uh i've met a lot of musicians who are in this space and and i do think there is something to that i don't know if it's um that they're just creative people and you know open source software is a way to be creative another outlet for their creativity or yeah i'd be curious to kind of delve into that deeper uh but I agree with you. I think that it's a common theme that you find with people who are in this world. Uh, it is. It's good insight. <laughs> so, you know, Thunderbird is your, um, your day job and they support Linux natively. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to guess that you're able to talk freely about Linux with the people you work with yeah. um, without getting the crazy looks from people. But what about your local area, um, the people you meet, the friends you have? Um, do you find them interested or even like receptive at all to Linux? Yeah, I think so. I think when I was in Denver, you know, it was much more, uh, I guess, much easier to f to find fellow Linux people. I've spent 
the last few months in a smaller town in Colorado up in the mountains. And, uh, but I, I found that Linux is recognized a lot more frequently than it was <laughs> growing up. You know, I could not find anyone, <laughs> especially in a small town yeah. generally who would know what Linux was, would have any idea what I'm talking about. But here, and the last few places that, that I've lived, I've been able to find generally a, pretty consistently a gr- groups of people who, who are tech enthusiasts, but also normal people now, they've absorbed it through osmosis. They know a little bit about Linux. It seems like even people who, like my uh, in-laws, you know, uh, just random people who maybe I mention it, um, have some idea, at least some basis to have a conversation about it, whether it's like, oh yeah, that's the thing, you know, that powers the cloud or that's the, like... (laughs) Sometimes it's a little strange how they have the connection, but they have at least a starting point to say, yeah, you know, it is uh, the thing that powers the cloud and this is the other ways that it's used. Uh, But also a a lot of young people who I talk to, maybe they talk to me about their careers, they're interested in development or something like that. And they, they have also some some idea what I'm talking about, um, which is encouraging because I don't think that was so much the case even among people who wanted to go into programming, young, you know, teenagers getting out of high school who wanted to go into programming. I don't think that was the norm whenever I was whenever I was in high school. Right. And so I think that things have changed quite a bit uh in that respect and there are people here who know what I'm talking about and who I can sync up with every once in a while if I want to talk nerdy. Well, I can't say the same for my local area. Uh, there isn't many people that know what Linux is or even, uh, or even, yeah, there's just no way. <laughs> uh, before we go too far into Linux, uh, let's go back to your beginning, uh, your start with computers. So what was the first computer that you used? It, you know, I, I think because I was, I was too young to have a really, some people say they know, especially people my age say they know. I don't know if that's ever true. <laughs> but I'm fairly certain it was an Apple IIe. Uh, I, the problem is the... It was my father's computer that he gave to my grandmother whenever we upgraded to a new computer. And I can't actually, he and my grandmother cannot nail down what it was, what computer it actually was. <laughs> so I have to go based off of what I remember it could do yeah, and how it operated. And I vaguely remember, you know, precisely how it looked. So it's like it, when I look online, I've because I tried to figure this out just for my own interest, and I'm fairly certain it's an Apple IIe. Um, it had a uh, the text was kind of greenish, and you loaded floppy disks into it, large floppy disks. I don't remember what the uh, name for that specific type is, but I played games on it at the time they were all really fun to me but i realize now that they were all learning games so you know <laughs> so now they're not so fun <laughs> <laughs> well it's just it's just interesting you know it's kind of a a trick yeah it's like okay well you you answer the math problem the little guy the little robot moves across the screen you know you get to the end you win uh and uh other things like that. I do think I'm trying to remember what other um, games I played on that one, but I mostly remember the math robot game. The 
the other thing I remember is watching my grandmother. She worked at a school at the time and she came home and she, I remember one time she wanted to type something out, some document. And so I, she was using whatever the word processor was. Uh, and that was interesting at the time. Uh, the computer was for games to me right? <laughs> as a little kid. So it's the fact that someone was using it for something else especially something that seemed so boring was was like what what are you doing why are you, why are you using it for this but uh thinking back on it 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 was interesting to have seen that and to think back on how far we've come and yep. also how what hasn't changed there's a lot sometimes i think that that we really haven't uh changed that much from some of the initial ideas about user experience and things like that Right. Um, when do you get your first computer for yourself? Uh, it depends. We had a family computer for a long time. Uh, and so my first one was when my, my dad retired the, one of the family computers and I, and it was still working. So I was like, Hey, this is mine. (laughs) And, uh, and I remember my grandparents had the same type of computer and they retired theirs at the same time. So I took the RAM out of it and it, there was another slot open and, and popped it into the computer I'd gotten from my dad. And, and then I had a much, uh, sl- well, not much better, slightly better. Slightly computer. better. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, I, I was very unfortunate in that uh, I, was a kid in a time when there was uh, ESL broad broadband for most of my peers, but I lived out in the middle of nowhere, and so we had dial up until I left home. You know, it was dial up on the farm, and right. so I had to. I probably I may have covered this on a different video on the internet, but I I would go to school, download whatever Linux distribution I wanted to and then <laughs> burn it to a CD, bring it back home so I could install it on my computer. And uh, that's when I started getting into Linux. I got really interested in uh, just the idea of being able to customize the computing experience. Right. And uh, something about that just really worked. And it, it was, I was probably 14, so 2004, maybe Maybe 2003, but I think 2004 is when I really got into it. How did you hear and, about it? You know, I really, I, it's a good question. I don't remember. No one told me about it. Uh, no one put me onto it. I think in my school, I was probably the first person amongst my peers to uh, discover Linux. I was from a really small school, though. It was 100K through 12 in the middle of rural Missouri. So that kind of makes sense. <laughs> yeah. But I think it was, I was trying to look at how to change my desktop in Windows. I just wanted to theme it, do something different with it. it I wanted to make it look cool, <laughs> which now is like kind of ugly, but the, yeah. but my idea of cool was, you know, it needed to look hackerish, and uh, <laughs> and, during that, I think I discovered some screenshots, maybe a video of the desktop um, cube and uh, and the other, you know, burning wobbly windows, things yep. like that. Compass. And, yep, com- and Compass and um, Barrel were like the, they, that was just it. I was like, I have to figure out how to, how to do this. And so uh, I learned as much as I could about about Linux in an attempt to uh, replicate that on my machine. And, and I was successful, and, and I was also really naive because once I did that, I was like, Linux is the best thing ever. And uh, <laughs> I admit to it now, but I didn't cop to it for the longest time. I went into the computer lab, and I don't know what came over me, but I just installed Linux on like <laughs> most really? of the computers in the computer <laughs> lab at school. <laughs> And then whenever they were like, what is, what, what did, who did this? Like, what happened to these computers? And I was like, I'm not saying 
anything. Uh, I, like, I, I thought for some reason at the time, I thought people would be like, this is great. But uh, that was very a very strange thought to, to have. Don't, don't worry about it. Nobody will ever know. It's our yeah. secret. <laughs> well, I don't think anybody's going to come after me now. But uh, it was, it's, I, I thought it, I was convinced it was just a better computing experience. And so I thought, oh, I'll just do everyone a favor and <laughs> install it on these machines. So were you, I mean, obviously you're installing it on it. So you became pretty much a, a advanced user at an early age. Um, there was no fear of trying Linux or. I think that's part of it though, is that I was young enough that I didn't, didn't have any, there wasn't any ever any thought of fear, you know, it was just, I just wanted to figure it out, wanted to play with it, wanted to understand especially at the time now there's there's so much information about linux and uh, things are a lot more defined too which is both good and bad things are more stable but they're also uh not as i don't think it's as up in the air as it used to be uh at the time you were part of a secret club almost <laughs> and everything was everything was in flux you didn't know oh you know is is linux going to just disappear you know is it is it is it here to stay at least that was my feeling at the time and and um i don't know i i kind of thought that it was cool to uh do something not a lot of other people were doing and have the shared secret with people on the internet. But also uh, it, the cool factor was so high that the, that there wasn't any fear about, and I had my own computer, so right. I wasn't doing things on like the family computer and, and I could do anything I wanted and, and uh, experiment and break the install and reinstall, and, which was like the first, Four years of using Linux was just me reinstalling or installing a different distro every couple of weeks because I would either get it into a state where it really wasn't usable or I would just get bored. But wow, yours, I mean, all of the things you've been mentioning, it's like we have such a similar path of how we <laughs> took it. And I mean, I spent so many times reinstalling Linux that it was, yeah, yeah. it brings they, back some memories. The only thing I wished I had understood better was how to contribute early on. I think I sat on the sidelines for a very, very long time. You know, I was using it for uh, most of high school on one machine. At, eventually, I got a, a couple computers. So, and I had one that I could play Windows games on, and then one that I could play with Linux on, um, which was, it would look hilarious now if I had pictures of it because there's, a desk with two big, you know, computer towers on it. And I had two monitors and, and just amongst my peers at the time, that was like weird. <laughs> and, yep. and, uh, I had a phone cable <laughs> running from <laughs> downstairs to upstairs <laughs> and, uh, I could connect to, you know, the, I, I couldn't do it at the same time as the downstairs computer, but, I could connect to the internet and uh, and use it upstairs. I just thought it was the best thing ever. Uh, so you said you went back and forth to um, the library or whatever to grab the disks, the, grab the Linux distros. What distro did you try first? I think it was Mandrake. I I remember that I'm ninety percent certain it was Mandrake. Um, and but that that didn't last as that long because ubuntu was a new player on the block and um i discovered it fairly early on and i thought this is it's just a little easier to understand for me and so then i started using it and documentation i think was fairly good right right out of the gate um so i don't know how long i was on mandrake but uh, 
but I quickly made the switch over to Ubuntu and I and I still played with other distros, but I always came back to Ubuntu because it was just I could get going so much faster. Right. And not have to mess around with it as much. And if you're breaking it all the time, you have to <laughs> select a thing that they can get you going quickly. Yeah. So uh, thinking on that experience with Mandrake um, and you're uh, younger and you're trying to tell your friends about Linux, what would you have told them about the good and the bad about it? It was a hard sell to friends because the games weren't there. And, and I don't remember when I started talking to them about wine, but I remember when I did it, it was still hard, hard, hard to, I mean, your, your success rate was not high, at least in my experience. Uh, and so I, I think that most of my friends w found it interesting but it was not something that they were <laughs> interested in putting on their own machine. And, you know, computers are ubiquitous now, and you can always, uh, this may be talking from a point of privilege, but it seems like if you're interested in computers, you can always track down a computer someone's getting rid of nowadays to throw something on to experiment with. Uh, back then makes it seem like a long time ago. I guess it, it was a while ago, but... <laughs> it was a lot harder to find an extra computer to just mess with, or at least in my experience it was. Yeah. And so I didn't really have, I was fortunate in that I got my hands on old family computers, you know, that they were going to try to sell or give to the library or whatever. And I said, no, 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 I, I have things that I want to try, <laughs> but, uh, but not most of my friends didn't have an extra computer that they could just, play with and not worry about breaking and i don't think they had a lot of interest uh even though i had geeky friends they were more interested in making games than run than playing with operating systems right. so uh i did at the time later in high school i remember that i, I don't e pc and hp sold some computers with ubuntu pre-installed and I, they were netbooks. And I remember finally talking about it one day and someone being like, oh, my sister uses that every day. And uh, talking about Ubuntu on the netbook she got. Yeah. And I was really excited about that because I thought, oh, this is like the beginning of the revolution. Like everyone's going to have Linux. It's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, uh, but it didn't quite pan out that way. Uh, but m I would say that uh, it wasn't until I got into college that I started really finding people who were interested in, in Linux and who I could really talk to about the things that I was doing with it and have them understand and care. Right. <laughs> so you mentioned that you had them two computers. Um, is there a point where you dual boot Windows? Uh, for gaming, or did you keep them separate going forward? Yeah, I, I, I did have a dual boot on the Linux machine because part of why I wanted two computers was, uh, really I wanted as many computers as I could get my hands on. <laughs> but if I had two, then if I had a LAN party <laughs> at my house, that was one less machine that somebody had to bring, which was already really hard, um, because. We just, I just did not have a laptop, period, until I was 18 uh, and out of the house. And none of my friends did either. So we would have LAN parties, but they would have to bring their computer from home, which some, for most of my friends, it was a, the family computer is the same thing. And so they had to say, like, hey, mom and dad, I'm taking our computer. And that wasn't always an easy sell, so so having an extra computer around was was useful. So, do you still use Windows today? No, I don't have a Windows machine. I haven't for years. I when I first got one of my laptops, 
that I use now, it had Windows on it. And I used it for a week to document how to build Thunderbird <laughs> on Windows. <laughs> but then then it was gone. I I just don't it's it's now it's even if even if there were things that I wanted to do on Windows, I I haven't used it very much for a long time and it's just when I get into it, it's the user experience is frustrating and I'm just used to all the Linux isms and so it's it's very hard to to spend time in there because there's always something that's gonna just grind grind on me. And Proton for gaming, at first, you know, this Proton thing, I was kind of looking sidelong at it like, okay, you know, is that gonna pan out? But now I have I don't game near as much, but I do have some games that that are Windows games and they run really, really well on my computer with Proton. And so I don't I don't even have that was one reason that, you know, I would have booted up a Windows machine, but there's virtually no reason to do that now because I every game I've tried that I wanted to play that is a Windows game in Linux with Proton has worked just fine. And so it there's hasn't been the desire to <laughs> dual boot. Yep. Well, we're in a really good place right now. Uh, there's a few holdouts uh, as far as games are concerned, but not working on Linux, but we're in a really good time as far as having multiple selection, thousands of titles now work on Linux. Yeah. So. And people kind of bash on Stadia, uh -huh. you know, and other cloud game streaming platforms, but I think that we as the Linux community have to be careful about that because that's probably like one of the best things that could happen to the Linux desktop is if we remove games as a uh, problem area. And if all you need is Chromium on Linux to play most games, then I don't, I don't really have a problem with that. There are, there, of course, you know, a lot of people's issues is that it's, they they worry it'll be laggy, you know, requires an internet connection, et cetera, et cetera, which are valid um, complaints about a service like that. But at the same time, if it, if I can convert someone to you try Linux and be a, and say, hey, all your or most of the games you want to play are you, there's a way to do that. I think that's really great, and. Uh, there's just it's just so much better than it was like you said it's it's just night and day well i think uh especially with the google stadia um they people have a problem with it uh for the reason you said about the lag but i look at it as if anybody has the technology or the people or the ba money backing to solve that problem it's google so I think I, a more of a concern for me would be, are they going to continue that? You know, they have a tendency to <laughs> bring up projects and just drop them completely. So uh, if you if you went full into that ecosystem and bought your games there, and and then all of a sudden they decide, oh, we're we're dropping, that. yeah, <laughs> then you're out of you're out of luck. One thing that's interesting though is they have to port the game to Linux for it to run on. Uh, uh, their platform, and so I think that's a net good. Not every person who does that is going to release a Linux version, but some of them will. I th I think, and uh, because they like money, <laughs> and <laughs> and if if they have already done a lot of the legwork to make it work on Linux, I don't you know I don't see why they wouldn't. I know that we're not the largest user base when it comes to games. Even, even though I think there are a lot more Linux users out there than most people think, I don't, I think, I think a lot of them don't go there for their games. They've, they've just become accustomed over time to the fact that they're going to have to go to some other platform, be it a console or uh, dual boot windows or whatever it is to run their games. Um, so I think that's an issue, 
I think we'd be a little bit bigger on the <laughs> on the user <laughs> stats if that wasn't the case. But I, but there's years and years of training to get over there. But I I hope that these companies that port their games to Stadia and whatever, you know, I've seen that there might be other game streaming platforms like maybe a, a Steam cloud stream platform. Uh, I hope that that work will be available to Linux users. Yep. Well, you mentioned that uh, you don't use Windows in any way anymore. Um, do you have you ever been a Mac user? No, I wanted to be whenever I was uh, in high school. Oh, well, w the first few computers we had at, at home were, but I don't think that counts anymore. Yeah. <laughs> they were old, you know, Mac, Mac OS. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it's, it's not the same experience at all now. I have used it in that when... I worked at a few jobs. I had to support Mac machines and I had to support Windows machines and Linux machines. And so I, I used all three platforms, but I, once again, well, Mac's, Mac's better than Windows in that some of my Linux isms <laughs> hold there. I can, yeah. I can open up a terminal and do some things. I mean, I know that uh, it's not really the way to accomplish what you want to on that platform because of trial and error of being like, okay, well, you know, I've got a terminal. I know how to interact with it. I know how to solve this problem on Linux. I'll do the same thing on Mac. And it's like, oh, that's not really going to work. No. But, but uh, it didn't feel like Windows where I've just the paradigm, the computing paradigm there and the user experience is diff so different enough that it's just computing if you don't touch it very often when you come in, it's, it can be confusing to find, for instance, they have like three control panels now. <laughs> and so <Yeah. laughs> it's when you go in, you're like, where is this? And well, I'm in, I thought I was in the settings, but apparently I'm not in the right settings. And so, uh, no, but I've never been, uh, I haven't been a Mac guy recently enough to, to say that, I know enough about the platform to talk about it with any gravitas. Right. So you used to distro hop all the time because you would install distros. Um, do you still distro hop or do you have like a main machine? You've got to have stability. I, n I never thought that I would stop distro hopping. <laughs> I just, I didn't understand when people would say the older Linux community members would say, I just don't really have the time to hop around a lot and I have real work to do and et cetera, et cetera. But I became that guy. I can't place my finger on when, but, uh, this, it, I have elementary OS. It's been running on my two machines for a, a while now. And, uh, I don't know, a while being probably two years and before that I think one of them was Ubuntu and one of them was elementary OS but it's just I've I haven't been jumping around I've just been trying to accomplish whatever my work was on the machines and and uh, it's hard to ensure that you can get everything done if you're hopping around Yep. If I had another machine, I might play around, but I, uh, no, I wouldn't. I just <laughs> wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, elementary is absolutely beautiful. What What are the reasons why you landed there and said, this is what I want to run? Well, I talked to, one is that I, for a long time, I was getting lunch with Cassidy once a week. <laughs> Cassidy Blady, the one of the co-founders of Elementary. Yeah. And uh, we disagree on actually, we disagree on a lot and we agree on a lot. And one thing that I think the Linux desktop has always needed is just polish, polish, polish. Take something, keep polishing it, keep making it easier. Even power users, a lot of power users want to be able to accomplish things 
easily, all the little things easily. And the big complex things that they want to do, they can do that. But when it comes to like changing a setting or whatever, I don't want to drop down into the terminal to do that. I just want to switch or a little toggle or whatever. Yep. It's, and so, and they, and, but the biggest thing is they really, really care about, about keeping feature parity with the other platforms. For instance, um, you know, they put in a, uh, they call it nightlight, uh, but it's, you know, a red, uh, blue tint. What do they call it? I don't know. I, but it, like red it shift. changes. Yes. A red, a red shift. So that the color, and they did that really early on in that trend. And they, and there are just a lot of things like that, like dark mode, you know, they put a lot of thought into it. They don't have like a system wide dark mode right now, but I know that they've, made a lot of their apps to where you can select a dark mode and ultimately the aim is to experiment so that they can roll out a dark mode that actually makes sense and works well yeah and i just think they put a lot of thought into how to accomplish these things but they also keep up with the trends in computing which is nice because you get accustomed to some of these things on other platforms like on my android phone they there's an android dark mode now there's yep. you know all these things that, that you just start to get used to and then when you go to your desktop and you don't want to feel like you're running something that it doesn't really meet the same needs as the other computing platforms you use i i don't know if there's a more succinct way to say that but there's just uh, just really smart guys behind that project and and i feel like they they have a good mind for uh, producing a, a desktop for producing a computing platform you want to use. Yep. And I think that other distros, especially ones backed by corporate money, could learn from, from what they're doing. You know, it's it's sad that kind of a, it, in term, terms of resource, virtually nothing compared to the Red Hats and the um, canonicals of the world. And it's sad that they're nailing this every release when these bigger guys have a lot of issues nailing some of the basics. Can you imagine if they had that type of resources, what they could do? It would be absolutely <laughs> amazing. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think when it comes to the Linux desktop, I'm going to say things that are going to make people mad. I think. The Linux desktop and desktop computing in general is it's the truck of computing. You know, you're you're trying to accomplish things. Desktop computing is, but then I'm gonna tie in Linux in a second. Desktop computing is the truck of computing. You have you use it for tasks that are like big tasks, um, editing video, edit, editing photos, developing applications. You know, these are the these are the things that really it's becoming in gaming, you know, but uh, high end gaming. But I think that's good for Linux. I think that these other operating systems are chasing different use cases, or have been at least, especially Mac. Yeah, they've kind of pivoted back towards spending some resources on keeping up with what desktop users need but but I think they their real focus is in this kind of uh consumer computing where it's just you're just consuming content you're right. you're maybe making a dock you know you're not doing the really crazy things so I think there's a sp- there's space there for for Linux and to be the premier operating system on desktops in the next 10 years as like the workhorse as the the truck of computing and then there you can use all these other things are the sports cars and the and <laughs> whatever <laughs> but uh so that's that's good uh i think that there's a lot of opportunity there if if we can nail a good a good experience that allows people to get what they want done um, but I think when it comes to other form factors, 
I think Android and Chrome OS and these these other consumer platforms are probably going to win out. And I'm and in my in my experience in the Linux community, I'm not sure that one of these Linux distros will become uh even with resources would necessarily have a path to become a mainstream operating system. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't want to hear that, dude. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I I just I it's it hurts me a lot, but at the same time, I think that there's lots of space in in computing for Linux to succeed for desktop Linux to succeed. I'm just not sure when it comes to grandma, the boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, the average user. I just, I think that making the case to them is, is becoming easier, but I think that computing trends are shifting so much that it's, it's almost, it's almost harder too, because you're, you're competing against you, Android, you're competing against iOS in the normal computing space right. and these device types that we were not able to do and, and at the moment and maybe System76 or Purism will nail, you know, those things. But I I still think we're, there's a, a great future for desktop Linux. I'm not sure it's just, I'm just not sure it's in the the mainstream. I think it's for creators and you know people who make things right well let's talk about thunderbird a little bit um thunderbird has been around for you know many years but tell us about the, you know the growth of thunderbird and you know the separation from mozilla but still under the umbrella so like take us through that sure uh so thunderbird everybody knows thunderbird it's it's been around for a long time. It's an email client for those of a, those of your <laughs> uh, followers who, who don't know what it is, but it's an email client that was developed by Mozilla. Uh, you know, if I say when it was, what year it was started, I think I won't get it right, but it's, it's oh, an older piece of software. Yep. It's open source. It's, it's uh built on the Mozilla platform, so it shares a lot of code with Firefox. And uh, and it's healthy. It's a pretty healthy um, project. We have, you know, millions and millions of users. Um, we have 10 million daily active users, and uh, we suspect we have about 30 million, you know, people who use it on a regular basis. So that's a lot of people. Um, Yep. We were, I, I was brought in in 2017, uh, I think. And, uh, and since then, uh, the, we've been able to continue to grow the project. We have more resources than we did. We have more people working on it. Lots more people working on it. I think I was a second employee now we're up to 10. Uh, and we're going to hire a few more people, but um, and we have a plan going forward uh, to make it the best email client out there. And i I think we can, I think we can convert a lot more people to use it. So, are are you still under the Mozilla umbrella? We're in the Mozilla family. The Mozilla Corporation creates Firefox. Um, we're under the Mozilla Foundation, which is the nonprofit arm. Uh, and we're, you know, there's always discussion about where is the best place for, for Thunderbird to live. And I think we're going to try and continue to have that conversation and, and decide because where, where it lives un within Mozilla makes difference for what you can do. For instance, if we want to offer services or anything like that, Thunderbird related services, we'd have to make changes in order to accomplish that. Um, but, but right now it's, we're, we're kind of heads down trying to 
just improve the software and make the experience better for our users. And uh, and Mozilla is only helpful in in helping us do that. And uh, even under the foundation, you know, we share a lot because we share a lot of code with Firefox. We have a lot of we make a lot of friends on that <laughs> side of Mozilla, and we and we have to collaborate with them. We have to collaborate with them to you know, make sure that everything works and that Thunderbird keeps getting built and is healthy. And, and so, uh, so we're, we're definitely still a part of the Mozilla family. And, and I think we, we add a lot of value to that ecosystem. So the last time I talked to you, you were, you were working for Thunderbird, but I think you added a few things in your title to the things that you do at Thunderbird. Um, what is it, that you want to see Thunderbird do specifically? What like if you had one goal for Thunderbird to to get to, what would you like that to be? Well, I think there there's a ton, but one thing in particular I think is that the way that people use email or the options that are available to them are a lot different than when Thunderbird started and and kind of the paradigm, the user experience paradigm that we've created in Thunderbird is, is the, the program itself can do anything that you want to do with email. I mean, it's just, there are so many ways that you can accomplish. If you have a specific workflow you want to accomplish, you can do it in Thunderbird. Like the settings are there. The, <laughs> you can make it happen. But I think that, for someone coming in who wants to better manage their email, I think out of the box, there are a lot of things that we can adjust in the experience that just makes it easier for someone as soon as they install it and they set up their account that improves their email experience. And there's probably a hundred things under that umbrella that we've documented or tried to document uh, on how we could improve that, um, the default user experience in Thunderbird. And I think, I think we're gonna get there, but that's the number one thing that, that I would change is just those, those things we've identified, those would just be done. Right. And someone would start up Thunderbird and their email would be, laid out in a way that's easy to manage and you can quickly do things that that help you get to that inbox zero but actually in getting to it it's not just like archiving the email okay great you know i don't see it now it's not a problem but more so actually like do a, is this a task i need to create you know convert that email to a task when i finish the task it prompts me to for instance send an email to the person who sent the email to begin with. So if somebody, if you send me an email, you're like, Hey Ryan, you know, can you do this for me? I could say like, okay, I'm going to turn this email into a task. Once I hit complete on that task, it asks me, do you want to send Rocco a message telling him this is done? Yes. You know, did it. Uh, here's the information you need. And then email doesn't just get lost too in the shuffle. Like there should be actual ways to make yourself more productive. Um, with your email client. And so uh, that's, I guess, just the, improving the user experience is a thing that, that I've been a big advocate of. And I, I think we're, we're getting there. Well, zero inbox is like, uh, just like the, a dream that I don't think will ever happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very hard. It's very hard. We, a lot of us too, our, our inbox is like our to-do list which is, I think, not, not good. I don't think that's a, a good way to track what you need to do. I don't know if that's the case with you, but I find myself doing that case. sometimes, <laughs> even though I know that it really shouldn't be. Uh, and so, I, but knowing that, that most users, at least when they're using email in a business setting, are using their email that way, if we bear that in mind, we can actually experiment, do user testing, 
figure out how we can improve their lives and hopefully make uh, for a great email experience. And most of the work to accomplish that is already done in Thunderbird. It's just exposing it to the user in a way that they know how to set that stuff up and make it make it work. Right. Well, I mean, in today's world, there's a big prominence of webmail. Um, some users are never going to want to use webmail. Some users um, are never going to want to use a client. But how do you go about making Thunderbird relevant to those users of webmail? Well, I, th I think that when we talk about that, Gmail is a big player in that space. And they really do well on making email a lot easier to categorize. Uh, they have a special name for it, but I just know that the inbox gets segmented into like five different segments where they automatically put email. It's like social and promotions and yeah. Yes, exactly. And I think that is challenging. It's a challenging competitor to have <laughs> to be up against someone who has a service who also has a pretty good client offering, even if it's just the web client. The, and the other side of that is that Gmail isn't really the best um, partner in this because they they don't want you to use an alternative client. Right. They they don't don't control that. Can't show you ads. Can't you know extract the the what they want from you right. as much. So part of making Thunderbird relevant to users is going to be. A, making it just easier to access your email, which I think clients do in general. Like clients that sit on your machine, you click a button, you've got your email, you can view it offline, you can, you, you can, there's a lot more power there. The thing that I think we've leaned maybe too much towards, and unfortunately it wasn't on purpose, is that we fulfilled a lot of power users' needs, but we haven't. As I said earlier, I haven't made it easy, haven't made it easier than the web clients that they have, haven't made it faster than the web clients that they have. There are a lot of ways that I think we could be more relevant to users by making things easier. One thing that people say that they're interested in, even some normal users, they say, I'm sending sensitive stuff over email and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to actually protect the email. Right. For instance, you know, you're sending over documents for your business, but if you're a small business owner, you may not know how to send a piece of email that if it gets picked up along the way for some bad reason, it's not somebody doesn't just have your bank account number or whatever. And so uh, some of that stuff is going to be it, telling people, Thunderbird makes it easy to send secure email, period. You know, you can, it's not, you don't have to understand cryptography. You don't have to understand all this jargon. You can just click, this has to be a secure email. And then we can figure out the stuff in between that makes it so the other person on the other side can see what you're sending, but no one else can. And I think we, I think, it's these are hard problems to solve, but they're but they're not impossible. And I th and I think we have the right people working on Thunderbird to accomplish them. Right. I mean, most of the people contributing to Thunderbird are really email domain experts. Like they 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 know they're some of the most knowledgeable people about email probably in the world, and and uh, they have great ideas for how to accomplish this stuff, but for so long, the future of Thunderbird was unclear, you know, when it got jettisoned out from the corporation, it wasn't, they weren't sure, can the community support this? What's going to happen to it? And uh, now that we are on much more stable footing, all these ideas can actually be implemented. And so I think just making it easier to accomplish some things is going to go a long way, like secure email, like 
maybe recommending to people how to do other things to keep their communication safe online and private. Um, we don't have to mine their data for any purpose. We, we have a bunch of different, uh, we have different goals than the Gmails of the world. Uh, so we get to do stuff that they wouldn't do. And I think that that will allow us to be more relevant in a, in a world where people are more conscious about where their data is, who's looking at it, you know, things like that. Right. Well, I know one of the barriers for me at the time was uh, using ProtonMail. And I know they have a, well, the, I did, the last time I tried it, it was a beta uh, for the Proton Bridge that you could set up with Thunderbird. Um, but it was a something that was constantly being updated because it was in beta and it was a little bit cumbersome sometimes. So I'm not, I'm hoping that they get that worked out and get it a smoother experience um, to be able to uh, use Thunderbird in a, in a nice way and not just, you know, have things running in the background and just have a smoother experience. Yeah, I agree. And they've done some work on the bridge to make that easier, but yeah, I I also have a pro I have a Proton Mail account and it's it it's getting better each release of the bridge, but it's it still has some hiccups here and there and and uh and I think what they're doing is great, but yeah, there's there's some ways to go there and and uh but you know we at least it exists at least the service exists there's yep. there's a being able to just i mean there there's always been kind of services that you could pay like fast mail and things like that where you could have your email and you know their business isn't about looking at your email and, and figuring out what you're trying to purchase online or what medicine you need or whatever <laughs> but uh having having a service like that that's that's focused on on privacy is is i think a really good addition to a really good option for a lot of people right so well if you had to convince somebody of using thunderbird what would you say to them to say you should use thunderbird because of this I think you should use Thunderbird because it is a workhorse and it can do anything that you want to do with email. And uh, I, I think that people who are skeptical or maybe have used Thunderbird in the past and it didn't meet specific needs of theirs should at least have it on their machine Put their you know, put any email uh, account on it, and then keep tabs on what what's changing in it because it's pretty rapidly changing, and see what the kind of things that we're doing, and get an idea of uh, you know just just see the change and see if it's what they what they want and what they like and if it's if it meets their needs. So uh, I think it's probably the most robust email client on planet earth <laughs> but agreed we're going to find we're going to continue we've already done a lot of work to improve how 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 the improve the experience around finding things in the client and around making it work precisely the way that you want it to but i think that work is going to continue and i think that's going to make for a really great experience and so people should a try it and then B, keep tabs on it because it's only going to get better. So what is your daily workflow like? Like what software do you need to run on your computer? Like say you do a fresh install. What do you need to, to work? Well, one thing that obviously has changed is that I use Thunderbird <laughs> and I use obviously. almost every part of it. And uh, at first, you know, I was skeptical when I came in to Thunderbird and people told me I use it for X, Y, and Z. And I do most of my work with it because I just, 
<laughs> even even coming in, I had used Thunderbird, but I just couldn't imagine having most of your work happen in the application. Right. But I have I you know my email, my chat, and my calendar. So my chat is via IRC with my team and my email and my calendar in here and 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 my tasks are too. And so I spend quite a lot of time actually just organizing everything and communicating with other people through Thunderbird. So now it didn't used to be this way, but now number one install on a machine is Thunderbird for obvious reason. <laughs> the <laughs> second one definitely is, is if Firefox isn't already on it, which it usually is because it's a Linux distribution, but Firefox is, it's, it's just a great browser and, and everything works the way that it should. And, um, I'm just been really impressed by the re releases and I'm not paid by the Firefox team. I'm not <laughs> even in the same, you know, unit at all. So this is, this is a true, uh, uh, endorsement, not just, you know, this is part of the Mozilla family. I honestly right. believe that it's a great browser and the categories sit or not categories. Uh, what's it called? The container um, tabs, the container add on. Yes, is like brilliant. I just think that it's the best thing ever. It's it is. Because you know, I think most people have w personal accounts, work accounts. Maybe they have other accounts. And it's it's so frustrating when you go and to like, for instance, I don't know, like Google Docs and you're already logged in with your personal account. So you got to log into a different account. With yep. containers, it's just ready to go. and And so I think that's great. Um, Lutris. I use Lutris for the games that I do play on my machine. It makes setting up um, Proton with those games super easy. Yep. Uh, and then uh, I'm on an elementary, so I have some that are elementary apps. Um, Notejot is a uh, application that creates these little almost post-it notes. <laughs> And you can generate as many as you want. And but usually in meetings, I pop one open, do always on top. And then, you know, I'm going through whatever we're talking about in the meeting, but I'm making those notes in that in that little post-it note on my screen. And then afterwards I convert it to a real, you know, whatever a real note in whatever application I can most easily share that with the person who I was meeting with. Right. But uh but I think it's just great for really quickly being able to jot down ideas. Uh, and beyond that, you know, I, I would say now you've got me looking, uh, <laughs> beyond that, I'm, and things are not too crazy. I like Typora for editing Markdown, uh, documentation. A lot of documentation nowadays is in Markdown. Mm -hmm. So I do up the documentation in Typora and then pop it into wherever it has to go. Uh, and I love making notes in, in Markdown or love, I just, Markdown is just the best thing ever. Um, and then code, I use Elementary's code, which is, it was their text editor, but now it's more of a, um, a code editor and, and it is just really a really great tool. And then finally, I've gotten into Android development lately and Android Studio is uh, just a great IDE and it takes care of so much of the little things for you that it makes me a little lazy, but it also <laughs> helps me to get something out that's interesting quickly. And none of my stuff is on the Play Store yet, but... Um, what I'm, are you working on? Well, I earlier this year, I told myself I really want to learn to develop for Android because I it's the computing platform that I probably use the most just because it's in my pocket. And uh, I, and partially, you know, I'm interested in um, helping uh, Thunderbird make the move to Android. Uh, it's not on a, the roadmap specifically yet, but we know that there are a lot of mobile users who really need a good client and so uh, i just wanted to learn more about it and uh 
So right now I have a note taking app and uh, a tasks app that I've been using for experiments for learning. Um, I think I will one day release those, but only after I've actually feel like I they're good and offer something interesting uh, and they don't get a ton of my time. So there that's probably still a few months out, <laughs> but it is fun to learn to, to, to make software for a platform. And especially I haven't done much mobile development, so it's, it's all very new and interesting to me. Right. So, I mean, I know that you don't, use windows or care to use windows in any way um but uh, obviously uh, thunderbird is cross-platform um is there any software on windows that you would think uh or that you think would make a difference for linux if it would come to linux i was just thinking about this the other day i think that the Adobe Suite, even though I know we do have alternatives that are getting so good, but I think that its brand is powerful enough that when people learn that it's not on Linux, it's really a hard thing for people to get over. They, you know, you some people are so in that world and they know the Adobe product so well that it just damages their productivity a ton whenever they have to relearn something. And, and it's even harder when that other application doesn't have this one niche feature that they, they need. Yep. I say that working in multiple businesses where open source software is a big deal and it's like that you the ethos is let's only use open source software, but even then the creative professionals who rely on that Adobe stuff are always the hardest to get into a workflow where they can be as productive on Linux. And I think we're going to solve that. But in the meantime, if Adobe came to Linux, I think that there were a lot of users who there wouldn't be an argument against coming over anymore. Uh, so that's the one that comes to mind for Windows. I think Windows, as much as I don't use it, I have seen that they've put quite a lot of work into making developers' lives easier. Um, I don't think it's as good <laughs> as... Linux, but it is interesting all of the work that they've done because it it definitely makes it harder to convince someone to come over to Linux when they have WSL, so the Windows subsystem for Linux, and these other tools are are getting so good that it's kind of like, well, I you know I can still build on Linux, I can still do a lot of this stuff that normally would have required Linux in the past. And I still have all of the windows programs that I, that are nice. Um, so, uh, that, that isn't really so much relevant to your question, but I think it's relevant to the divide is shrinking between the right. two platforms. And, uh, we gain, we've gained a lot of ground, but they're also gaining a lot of ground. Well, do you align yourself with those hardcore open source enthusiasts that only want to use open source software or more on the pragmatic side of using anything? I, I was much more hardcore in the past. It, now I think that there are some things that I want to use open source software for only because it's auditable. For instance, um, when I was picking, I use this thing on my phone called night screen, which okay. um, at night, you know, you have the blue light filter, but sometimes it's still too bright. Even if you turned it down all the way, you know, your, your 
spouse or significant other is trying to sleep and you don't want this bright light <laughs> just in the room. So it, it actually puts a, another darker filter on the screen. It just, it just makes it darker. Mm-hmm. But as I was looking at, I, as I was looking, cause I knew something like this existed. I was looking through what was available and they all need the privilege to see the contents of your screen because they're going to apply a filter to them. It's just the way that permissions and Android work. It, it, I'm not sure that they're actually pulling the data off your screen or looking at it for anything, but it says, you know, this will have access to the contents of your screen, right. which I didn't like. And so I found an open source one and I was, and I liked that I could go to the GitHub page, see what it did. Uh, I mean, it took a while, but I just really wasn't comfortable with using a proprietary solution that I, you know, they, who knows, are, are they collecting things from my screen? Like I, I do lots of things on my right. phone, like check my bank account and stuff. You know, I don't want that just going off to wherever. And so uh, I will use closed source software and I don't, I don't really have a problem with people using that. Um, but I think my, one of the, I think I'm pretty pragmatic about it in that there are certain things that I want to use open source because I know I can check that it's not doing anything nefarious. I can be assured that my data is safe and, uh, and I, you know, I don't have that much. that's really all that sensitive, but it's just the idea that, that, uh, of not knowing what people are doing on my machine that sometimes makes me uncomfortable. And, uh, I it's think it's not if, just you. Yeah, I think if most people understood kind of these things better, they would also be a, a bit more discerning about this stuff. But I think it's, it's not so clear to the average person uh, what what you're potentially giving up when you use the software. Maybe it's not doing anything bad, but yeah, there's just no way to know when it's proprietary software. You just have to trust whatever they say. And even sometimes what they say and what their privacy policy says are two different things. They'll yes. say like, yeah, we're we're not touching your data, and then it's like, well, in the privacy policy, we have, we reserve the right to collect any data uh, in this, this, and this category, and it's like that's everything. Like you, you, you're essentially saying you can collect any data that I that I, and some of it, you know, or some of them are platform features. Like when you get a phone these days, you know, when you're trying to use some of the basic features of the phone, the whoever it is, be it Samsung, be it Apple, be it et cetera, et cetera, will say in their privacy policy, like, we will collect this data from your phone for, you know, they, these purposes. And you know, some of them are like uh, fixing bugs and things like that. But then when you get down, it's like, but we reserve the right to sell them to partners, you know, <laughs> et, et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, no, I don't, I don't, I'm not really all that comfortable with that. And so uh, I try to be pragmatic, but there are situations where I just really want to be able to audit what's running on my machine. And, and I guess that makes me a little extreme, but um, I don't. Now, I don't think that makes you extreme. I think that makes you uh, aware of your surroundings and aware that there are people who want your information and being, ha having that choice uh, for privacy reasons of saying, Yes, I'm okay with this information going out, but I'm not okay with that information going out is is good. I mean, it you're definitely not extreme. <laughs> yeah. I I I think that most people get it too when when I talk about this and I explain, you know, friends and family are what I'm thinking of when I explain, oh well yeah, I use this because you know, it doesn't it it's it's it isn't going to take my data and use it in nefarious ways or sell it to whomever. Like I ha this gives me a level of privacy and control that, that I think is good. Um, yep. And people get that and they didn't used to get that. Like even 
four years ago. So the things have changed enough that the people are understanding these arguments and are feeling the same way. Yep. Well, I want to touch on something that um, you talked about. You did a video with Brian Lunduk. Um, I mean, you've done other videos with Brian, uh, but this recent one that you did, um, you talked about a topic that's not often talked about. And uh, sometimes it's, it's hard for people to do, but it was about taking a break and enjoying life. So tell us about that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think a lot of people have hardships in their life and, and I don't have as many hardships as a lot of folks out there, but at, you know, about the time that, that I uh, left uh, system 76, there was just, I think a lot of, a lot of factors in my life that, that made for just a really rough time. And, uh, and part of who I was and part of what I was doing was, was that I was a, um, fixture in some corners of the open source community. And I was pretty active and, and, uh, lending my voice to topics that I cared about. But, um, uh, about that time, I kind of knew that I needed to take a step back and kind of rearrange my life and and fix some of the some of the things that were really hurting me at the time and uh there was an aspect of burnout to it and the but there was also just um there was a piece of it that I really hadn't considered that that I just I needed to to take a step back and and maybe take a a break from from the community and i found during that process and it was it's it's not so much because you know i some people talk about maybe like in these communities maybe they're bullied or whatever i never had that you know i it was only a good thing but but just disconnecting from the constant information that you're getting the constant uh what's happening was really good and looking at doing more mundane things or I don't know, cooking <laughs> instead of doing real being life on stuff. Twitter. Yeah. Like, uh, uh, just reading a book, you know, it had been a while since I'd read a lot of nonfiction books, a lot of books that helped me become better in my expertise in my domain. But I, it'd been a lot, a while since I'd just sat down and read fiction, you know, <laughs> reading for the fun of it. And, uh, after doing that for a while, well, for a, a good while, I was still working on Thunderbird, but I wasn't, you know, engaging as much in things like this, which I enjoy, but I needed, I needed that breathing room and that chance to recalibrate my life. And now I'm really a big proponent of telling people when they're, when they are struggling or maybe they're you know, too caught up in what's going on online, you know, just, just connect, do, do something, you know, take a week away from it. Think about other things. It's almost like, um, what do they call that? When you're like watering the garden and you have a really great idea, <laughs> you know, or like, uh, there's actually like a word for it, uh, or, but, uh, I think I, that's hard for people to do, though, is to they, they don't want to unplug and and like just stop doing that and live life. Like, I, I think that's pretty hard for some people to do. Yeah, I think it is, too. I think it was really hard for me and it put a strain on a lot of relationship, you know, and in, in in real life. <laughs> I hate to say that because it's not really I have some of my relationships online are just as solid and interesting and engaging as you know the ones that the people i see every day but there is something to to just engaging with those around you and you know 
being present and being there. And I still struggle with it, but I've tried really hard for the past couple of years to say, when I'm here, you're getting 100% of me. You're getting, you know, my attention. You're getting, you're, I'm not going to look at my phone. My phone's on do not disturb probably half the time <laughs> around the, just in daily life because it'll interrupt you. And then you'll be the next thing, you know, you've, you spent 15 minutes looking at an email or, or looking at Twitter or reading a New York times article or whatever it is when uh, you really probably should set aside the times that you're going to do that. And the times that you're going to just be present in with the people who are physically <laughs> around you. Yep. And so anyway, I, I told Lunduk I thought that was important and that really refreshed me. And so not everybody's struggling with that, but for the people who maybe they're <laughs> feeling like something's wrong, maybe the, the, the solution is, you know, give yourself a little bit of time. It doesn't mean you don't have to use computers or, you know, you could still do that, but uh, more so it's disconnecting from the Twitter verse, the, um, one dude called it the Thunderdome, the, <laughs> just the constant, um, information stuff, yes. you know, that yep. that's coming in. And so, uh, I think that was healthy and, and, uh, it really made a big difference in my life and, and I developed some really great habits out of it. So. I, if anybody ever wants to talk about that, you know, they, sh they can ping me on Twitter and <laughs> that, that's kind of counterproductive, but you know, <laughs> they can reach out to me and I'm disturbed, but you know, they can get yeah. in touch with you. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if they want to, if people want to reach out to me and talk about that, I'm, I'm happy to, you know, to share the things that, that I changed and specifics on how I accomplished that. And then you know i think that's good advice man yeah so you know when i started running linux i used linux for certain reasons and later i found the community behind linux and and some awesome people and and now i say community is the best reason to run linux um but what are the reasons that you run Linux and what drives your, your passion for Linux? Well, now it's a pretty big part of my life. My wife says I should get a tattoo, <laughs> you know, of, <laughs> of something to do with Linux. She, she has a tattoo, you know, and, and sometimes I joke that, that I should get one. Um, but, and we talk about, you know, I say there, I want to get something that means something to me. And so she's like, oh, you should get something with, you know, that is related to like Linux or open source. And, you know, it does, it's now it's probably because it's just a part of me. It's just a part of who I am. It's uh, helped define s some of how I think about the world uh, and how I view humanity and how humanity accomplishes things, how humanity works together. So I think for me, it's also community in that uh, I love the ability of being able to have access to the people who are writing the software. Uh, and I like being able to contribute back to the people writing the software. So if I have an idea for how to improve something, there's not usually a lot of barriers between me and making that change so long as it fits in with the, the ethos of the piece of software I'm using. But uh, yeah, it's just, it is, it is a community and it's, and it's the ability to connect with people around what, what you're passionate about around the software or the problem you're trying to solve with the software. Yeah. So it's just the people and, the way that open source software is developed is just, it's just now it's an expectation that I have when I am dealing with software that I'm going to be able to connect with the creator and, and improve the software. So right. what does it mean to you 
when somebody uses the term year of the Linux desktop. <laughs> is that is that a thing? Is that a what possible does it mean? thing? <laughs> what does it mean to me? Well, I think the year of the Linux desktop has come and gone. It's still here. It's it's I'm people are not gonna like my answer, but uh the but Linux has won where where the number one server distro where the number one uh platform period computing platform android as a linux kernel i it's not the linux desktop that we that we wanted it's not the linux desktop that we uh imagined but you still have a lot of customizability with android and you can you and if you want to run your own rom like it's there's a lot of work out there to make that happen and on the desktop you have uh chrome os but you also have just so much so many good distributions that people are using that they don't even know that they're using linux like you go into some of these places like um in lowe's i was buying something and i realized they're running uh, some version of red hat or fedora or something and I see them interacting with it and they don't know they're using it. The, um, but, but they're using it. Yep. Um, you go into colleges when I was with system 76, you know, you connect with people who they're, they have computer labs where the, they're just Linux machines wall to wall. And that's just what they tell the students, you know, this is what, if you're doing these things, like this is the platform that you use for that. I think if we're already in that world and, and yeah, I think it will get better for Linux. I don't think it's going to look like people expect it to look, but I think that, um, will Linux will just be the basis of most of the computing we do. And then that last layer, that last bit, uh, of, mac os or windows that sits on a lot of people's desktop i don't think that's here to stay i think we're 10 years out from most people not using a traditional um desktop computing experience experience yep and so i i don't know how, what that's going to look like and maybe i'll eat my words i would love to i would love to be proven wrong i'd love for la every laptop that people buy to be running linux I don't think that's going to happen, but I think that I think that eventually most people will have a machine running the Linux kernel that they use to access services and that and other things that are delivered by Linux servers. And um, the free desktop, I think, will will be present for creators, like I said earlier. But I but I don't know that. I think a lot of people are just going to be consuming um content and so i don't think that they're going to necessarily come in contact with any real desktop experience i think the computing will be very situational like what are you trying to accomplish you know um and so the year of the linux desktop is here and i think it's only going to get better but i don't think it's going to look like like what we've been talking about for a long time i think Everyone's going to be using Linux. Everyone already is using Linux on a daily basis. They just don't know it. And I think that's going to continue. And, and uh, hopefully the free, de free desktop and free software that we love will be a big part of that. But I, even if it, I still think it will be good, even if it doesn't look like what we think it's going to look like. Right. Well, if you could change one thing about Linux, what would it be? Usability is a big one. I I think that that would probably be number one. Uh, and then um, maybe a more entrepreneurial spirit when it comes to the Linux desktop. I think if the Linux desktop were to succeed, it would be because 
people solve for the other for the other things that people need from their computing experience. For instance, we've been so focused on preloading laptops with Linux and that and and getting the hardware piece solved. I mean, that's what I hear a lot of people say is like if you buy a Linux machine, like that would yep. fix a lot of problems. I think that's true, but the platform needs to expose the user to do things better, to do things easier, to do things simpler. And so, for instance, people are interested in privacy right now. And I've been saying this for the past three years. We need a distribution that has a one-click VPN for their network settings already pre-configured, and you can just pay a a small fee to use that built-in VPN. And people always think, you know, that runs against user choice. Don't remove their ability to choose, but but lower the barrier of entry for a lot of these things. I think I think that would solve the first problem, usability, yep. but it would also solve the second problem. A lot of these distributions don't have the resources that they need to to improve continually pay to developers to work and improve the experience so it can compete with commercial platforms. I think lots of users are looking for all these privacy respecting and open source um, friendly like services. Like where do I back up my files? Where do I, you know, what VPN do I use? What, et cetera, et cetera. I think the list could go on, but um, building that actually into the desk, the computing experience by default, I think would really just be a fantastic win. So I, so I think just having a more entrepreneurial outlook in the open source community would, would just go a long way and, and make the Linux desktop that much better. Well, you would have a lot of pushback because there would be um, a lot of people that would say exactly what you said, that then you don't have a choice. But I think options are good. When, you know, if you don't have any options or if you have to manually configure everything, that's great for people who can. But when you're trying to um, give somebody Linux that is not technically savvy or, you know, just wants to just get on and use their computer, having that option built in is a, is a great idea. I love that. Well, we're we're still solving for fourteen-year-old Ryan. I feel like we're not solving for twenty-nine-year-old Ryan who, who has a lot of stuff, a lot of time uh, commitments for his day, and yeah, and it's not you're not if you if you solve for some of my problems that I know I you know I know in certain situations I should be using a VPN, you know, but I really don't want to set it all up and I don't want to think about it. I just want to click and go. I think that I think that solving for for the users who don't want to and it's why I'm on elementary you know I I'm not interested right now in tweaking every little thing I I I want to follow the best practices of using a computer and ha, and you know have the distro make recommendations to me I want smart people who make the products that I love to make the distro that I love to point me at other things that services and applications that I can use. And elementary is doing that great with the app center and pointing me at apps I should be using. But I also want to be pointed at services I should be using and know that they're going to work well with my machine. And so, so I, I just, I hope that that's something that we can get better at as a community. And, and uh, you know, every, I've tried to provide this feedback to, distro maintainers and walk them through what that might look like. I I don't have the expertise to build a distro and <laughs> and advocate and I don't really know if I had would have the time to advocate for it and really make the best experience. But and there are already people who are doing this really well. And so I'd really I'd really rather see them, you know, take the extra steps, whether it's Ubuntu, whether it's uh elementary, whether it's Red Hat, to just help users be better computer users and at the same time also make some money off of it. 
I mean, that's right. what I'd like to to see. Um, and yep. so being more productive. Yes. Um, yeah. Thinking back on the reasons that you chose to run Linux way back when, do those reasons still apply today? Uh, not in the same way, but I think customizability is a little different now in that more so now it's about what software I can use. And uh, no, the reasons I use Linux are are different. It's still the same basic concepts in that, in that I want control over my computing experience, but it's instead of wobbly Windows and desktop cube, it's now having the ability to audit the code and understand what's happening and communicate with the creators. So you still have good reasons to run Linux. They just grew a little bit. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I wouldn't mind on my desktop computer if, if I knew Compiz wouldn't break <laughs> <laughs> the, the using it. But uh, it's but I I I saw that somebody forked it and has been working on updating things. But uh, but it's yeah, it's it, that would be fun. But it it's, it wouldn't be the it's not the make or break feature. It was. No. Is there anything else you want to share with people? Um, not not particularly. Other than if you, other than try Thunderbird, uh, and follow me on Twitter or Mastodon, are my t two things that I'd ask I people to do. If to, they're interested. I try to get into Mastodon, dude. I just I have trouble because, like, uh, again, there's only so much time in the day. And, you know, you're either checking one or the other, and it seems you always lean towards one, and usually it's Twitter. Well, if you checked out my Mastodon, you'll see it's not updated as much as Twitter. Um, I am continually trying to be better at that. I'm also redoing... I'm, I'm going to try to... I'll let you know how this goes. I'm going to try and set up some ways to, to have... My, the stuff I do feed into the different platforms in a semi-automated fashion so that I can keep people up to date on what I'm doing uh, because I'd like to be able to write a blog, publish it, have something run that automatically pops it out to both platforms. But anyway, yeah, so people can follow me on Mastodon and maybe I've seen some people following me over the past week. It's some for some reason it ticked up. So I'll, I'm going to try to give those people a good reason to follow me and, and update that. But, um, but yeah, I think that if people are interested in hearing about Thunderbird or hearing about my thoughts on issues like the ones we talked about, <laughs> uh, that, that they should, um, they can follow me on Twitter or Mastodon and, and, uh, and talk to me, you know, the best thing about those social platforms is that we can have a conversation and I promise. And for all my uh, social media interactions to actually talk to you like you're a human and, and try to engage and not, not just, I don't know, not just like yell my opinions. <laughs> right. Which some people do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. This was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it, and I love the show. All right, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. Until next time, long live Linux.